Hello everyone, this is CL Cannon of Fiction Atlas Author Services, bringing you another Feel Good Friday author interview. Every week, I strive to bring you inspiring tales about the author journey. Today, I'm here with thriller author Andy Bailey. Thank you so much for agreeing to interview with me. No, thank you for arranging these. It's, it's a great idea. I think you've got quite a response, haven't you? I really have. I think I'm booked for the next 12 weeks. I'd never really expected that much of a response, which is great. Well, that's, that's self-inflicted. You did ask for that. I did. <laughs> <So>. I did. <laughs> the first question that I want to ask you is, what sparked your love of writing, and how old were you when you wrote your very first story? Um, I've been scribbling things for a while now. I mean, I'm, I'm getting on, I suppose you would say now. I'm 54 a couple of weeks ago. And, um, I, it's only, um, probably three years ago that I started sort of taking it seriously. And as much as I, I mean, my, my, my principal job, uh, my money earning job mm -hmm. is as a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Um, so I get, I write part time. Um, but from an early age, I've read and read and read. And I think that's um, the thing any, anyone who, who writes would, would probably say is that they obviously start out as readers. Um, right. So I've, I've read from, from, a, from a very early age and, and, and never stopped really. So um, and along the way have, have scribbled things um stories uh, at different times um as i say i've been 54 and, and and the the book that i've published so far is um martin dash self-published which i um completed and self-published in 2015 i'm um nearly finished the follow-up to that the intention is a trilogy the follow-up is in fact a, a prequel um, so those really are, are the, the main the main part of my output thus far. All right. um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, as I say, the first one self published, um, which which was all new to me. It's quite an interesting process. It really is, and I think a lot of more authors are choosing to go that route, and I'm really tickled about it because, I mean, the, the traditional publishers are all really nice, but in self-publishing, you have so much more control over what happens to your book, so I think yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's the, prob the problem I find is, is, is the usual one of time. That's the, I mean, what, what I found is, is the obvious point with self-publishing is that if um, you are publishing itself. You have to do everything yourself, obviously. So I've had to get up to speed with how to market and how to promote um, and learning how to do that and doing it obviously takes time. Right. Uh, so I, I, I did all of that. And, um, you know, the, the book's available on Amazon, you know, utilizing the usual, usual create space and KDP models um and then i did you know virtual book tours and, and that sort of thing which is all very interesting and you know it, it succeeded in shifting a number of copies um not enough for me to be able to uh, retire and do it full time <laughs> yet but I, I live in hope so you know with the, the next one i'll i mean i must admit the 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 first book i did um tout it around agents and and, and what have you um, didn't get a bite, which is, which is why I self-published. So when the second one is finished and ready, I, I will do the same, I'm sure, because, uh, again, with, with the limited time I have, I, I concluded at a certain point um, with the marketing and promotion of Martin Dash that that had gone as far as I could take it uh, at that point, having in mind that I, I did want to really spend what time I had then writing the next one. It was sort of pretty much a straight decision between moving from promotion and marketing the first to get on with, um, with, with, with writing the second because time is marching on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think after you have a series out, you know, they, you can kind of build on to your success with yeah. that also. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's been an interesting process. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer in, 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 in you know, commercial law business. So 
I, I have an understanding of how business works and, and, and what have, have you. You know, I'm not, not naive to those things. So, mm-hmm. uh, but having said that, it was uh, an interest. It was a steep learning curve as, as to, you know, the, the, the different marketing tools that, that are out there. And I spent some time reading stuff, you know, blogs and, and what have you. You do the sort, you know, the sort of thing that you do, I think. Right. Um, and, that that what what you say does echo um things that i read which, which say well that clearly if you've you know you you develop a backlist over a number of years it all cumulatively promotes your position generally really doesn't it so that yes. if what if somebody reads a book of yours then if you've got others available they'll they'll hopefully go on to those so cumulatively um, you're, you're growing a profile, I think, is the idea, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. I, I think it's a really interesting the way that Amazon chooses to market that, too, because especially if you have a series, they will market your other books to the same readers. So that's a, another yeah. algorithm thing that you have to take into yeah. context. That's, um, that's certainly the idea with, with, with these books. that I'm, I'm, I mean, I called it the Day to Night series, but it's, it's slowly merging emerging as in my own mind as the martin series because um the first one's called martin dash and without giving too much away the next the next book and the book after will be martin another surname and then martin another surname which is right. i don't like i don't like to uh, say too much about the, the the book i'm writing at the moment because the danger is it gives gives too much away and, right. and, the, and rather spoil it possibly for someone who's reading the book uh, the first book for the first time mm-hmm but uh, yeah, it's a, se- a series of three is the intention. Yeah. Okay. Well, what does your outlining process look like? Do you have a particular process that you go through every time that you go sit down to write a book, or do you kind of, you know, go a- do it as you go along? Or this um, the, the the book started um, really initially just from one idea and stroke two ideas. The the immediate thought was just myself one wandering home from the pub of an evening which is when i have my best thoughts uh and, and musing on things and what would it like be like um as, as a human being to actually not have the normal human feelings you know the normal human human emotions love and hate and desire what would someone like that be and and the the the, the story started from that single idea and which which is the nature of the character in martin dash the eponymous hero is a chap who's um ostensibly got a condition which i I then researched i i I then sort of you know you go online and, and and sort of research that idea and lo and behold there is a condition anhedonia uh, which, I mean, these things are can be quite fuzzy at the edges, but that is, is a condition that sort of matches to a large extent the idea that I had in mind someone who um, who, who literally does not feel those those normal emotions, um, and he went from there to another facet that he has is that um he has ex- has extraordinary looks he's sort of got the looks of an angel mm-hmm. um and I, and I actually that came from um a character in, in in a film um about oscar wilde the trials of oscar wilde um a character is played by an actor called john fraser um who one of my favorite films and he plays lord alfred douglas who of course was the um the young lover of oscar wilde and who was famed uh, in his day for his for his beauty mm-hmm. um and and it was that image um because what i realized is that if you've got someone who looks like that who tends to draw people in because because of the way he looks um but actually has a condition whereby he can't give anything back immediately sort of sets up a tension there so that was how the idea started to develop and then i just really started to give him uh, you know a backstory and um, going beyond that and um i mean what it what it what is said isn't it is that obviously if, if you're starting out writing perhaps the best thing to do is to write what you know so lo, lo and behold martin dash is a solicitor mm-hmm. he's and he starts out the the opening scene is um 
him at a job interview for, at, at a new firm in, in London. I, I spent all my 20s working in London. I, I relocated back to the north subsequent to that. But um, he, he's in a job interview for a, a biggish firm in, in London. Um, and the thing about it is that he discloses his condition so that people know about this condition and his, his reasons for doing that are explained in the book because you might think, well, why would you do that? But he does do that. Um, and so that another uh, sort of in-joke is that um, he, he's actually very successful at his job. And of course, solicitors, lawyers are credited uh, with being fairly bloodless and uh, <laughs> having no feelings. And so he's actually a fabulously successful lawyer. And a lot of the uh, clients love the idea that, you know, they that, that they love to have um, a strong lawyer at their side, someone who's fairly ruthless. So that the idea of having a lawyer who, who's, who's medically certified bloodless is uh, very, very attractive. So that's a little in-joke for the legal profession. Um, and it, it goes from there. He has, um, there, there's another colleague at the new firm who's uh, the daughter of a high ranking politician. And what I've done in the, in the book is mixed fact and fiction. Um, so it's set in 2007 at the point at which the Blair government is, is coming to an end. Um, and so the Susan Sachs, who's, who's the, lady, the young woman in question, her father is a fictional minister in the Blair government. Um, and so that's um, and, and she is intrigued by Martin Dash again because of the way he looks. And he's um, the, the word has been put out that, you know, colleagues at work have to have to have an awareness that he has this condition. And the thing about the condition is that. What it means is, uh, for example, social circum situations could be difficult because, for example, he doesn't really get humour. So mm -hmm. that if he's in a social context uh, where a joke is told, you know, something humorous, he's, he's sufficiently intelligent to have learned over the years how, how to deal with this so that if colleagues start laughing, he will laugh but more as a reaction because that's what he's understood, what he understands uh, one is supposed to do. And he's trained himself to be able to um, to, to function socially. This, this is the thing. And obviously, as a lawyer um, in a commercial firm, he has to understand how to uh, relate to the clients and, you know, and maintain some sort of relationship with them. So mm -hmm. the idea yeah. behind all that is is to sort of open up the idea. Uh, um, the, the, the book is, is, is intended very much as a page turner, as a thriller, mystery, stroke romance. But I also um in, include in there really sort of meditations within within the within the story and as part of the narrative this is the idea is um it could make one think about what it actually is to be human um mm -hmm. you know what are the components that actually make up a human character or even a human soul you know if you you're presented here with somebody who appears to be a human and many and in many ways almost the perfect human because the you know the the emphasis that's given nowadays on on on, on physical loops right. and yet right. and yet is missing the uh, apparently essential parts of a human so what is a human is it you know what 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 is needed for one to be human so that that's the sort of subtext that's there amongst all the other stuff there's there's politics in there as i say because um Susan's father is 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 is, is a high ranking politician. So the book is is a, is a thriller. Um, he gets involved in shady um, goings on with one or two of the the, the 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 property developer clients, and things move apace um, as the story goes on. Um, and in due course, um, a, a a character appears sort of out of nowhere halfway through the book who it transpires uh, comes from Martin's past. Mm -hmm. So at that point, obviously, um, Susan is, is, is very interested because she's, she's sort of been falling for him, effectively. But, of course, she's faced with this wall 
uh, 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 of getting nothing back from it, a wall of indifference. And she struggles with that and wonders if there's anything behind it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, lo and behold, then there appears a character from the past who might hold the key to um, how he's come to this position. Well, that certainly is intriguing. It makes me want to read the book right now. So. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's an interesting story, I think, and uh, I, I was, I mean, I, I'm, I'm writing really, um, you know, I, 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 I don't need to write to earn a living, I'm writing, I've got to a point in my life when I think, you know, I, I, here I am at a certain age, I want to do um, something before I, you know, toddle off, and... Right. What I've, re- I've I've toyed with various things over my life. I'd, up until three years ago, when I started the writing, we had a, I had a band. You know, I've always been sort of creatively inclined, but mm-hmm. finally got to the point where I thought, well, actually, what I what I really love doing, what I really would like to do, is leave behind a bunch a bunch of books. Mm-hmm. And so, really, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, is writing books that are intended. That, that are being written with a view to selling a lot of books. Um, so, you know, for example, the diffi- one difficulty I find with marketing it is that obviously books do get categorised, and you know, one can understand that, of course, because you know, if, if, if you're selling stuff as a, as a bookseller, um, you, you've got to be able to categorise books to a, a certain extent. But I found some difficulty in marketing this because. It is a mishmash of, um, you know, between a mystery and a thriller and a romance and sort of some social commentary thrown in and satire, you know, this humorous stuff in there. So um, what I'm doing really is is not going for the genres that are almost guaranteed to sell if you get them right, you know, like, uh-huh. you know, like crime or, 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 or ro- romantic, you know, purely romantic literature. I'm writing a book and books of, of the sort that I would want to read. It's, it's as simple as that. So that what gui- that's what guides me. Um, I, you know, I want to read, I've got plenty of books that I don't finish because it gets heavy going and what have you. And I think it's a real, obviously a real talent and a real thing to be able to produce literally a page turner that people start. And can't and can't and, and, and can't put down. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's the sort of book I like, and so it's written according to to my tastes of what I would like to see in the book. So it's the idea of it is that it's it's sort of quite light, you know. It, it has sort of serious themes, but it's not weighed down or bogged down. It's not tendentious. It's not too heavy, you know. It's um, it's got a style. That's that, that's that's quite succinct and, and moves swiftly through the story. I like that that it has that it's not specific to one genre because a lot of times those are kind of put into one box and you kind of already know what to expect because Absolutely. of the formula that you know that those genres have. So I like that it's kind of a hodgepodge of different genres. That's something that I sound like that that I would actually like to read. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's. Um, I mean, if you can call it a genre, I suppose, I suppose you could, but it's, it's, it's a genre that, that isn't a genre. But to me, that, that's a sort of under, it sounds crazy, but a sort of underexploited area, really. You know, you, it, it opens up a whole world. I think, I think there's some of the comments, I mean, you've had generally favorable reviews on the, you know, on the Amazon reviews and what have you. Uh-huh. Um, but, but the comments, I've the adverse comments I've had and I've had some I think have come from people who maybe were expecting a romance and you know reading think well there's not enough romance and that sort of echoes what you're saying really isn't it that if if you're reading a genre you you uh, expect that it'll be almost one dimensional it'll, it'll it'll work according to the the, the rules of that genre and mm-hmm. it will conform to a type throughout the book whereas whereas mine mine certainly doesn't um i mean it's it, it's it, it's what one example is that i i do um move from past tense to present tense without warning really and then back again at a different point and that's not 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 really a trick as such uh what, what i'm hoping is that actually people don't notice but 
it, it, it happens. I've, I've written it because actually when I'm writing, I, I tend to do that anyway. And I'll find that there are certain situations that um, lend themselves better to present tense. And then or, or possibly even within the same scene, it'll switch to past tense. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that sort of uh, the idea of that is that it sort of echoes um, one's experience of reality. Because the reality that you live in, it, it, I, I think, is, is not neatly divided into present and past, is it? I mean, every second that passes becomes past tense, but there's not a sort of dividing line there. So it's sort of, uh, uh, the idea is it's a lively sort of style that sort of feels more alive. So it's, it's, it's that sort of idea, really. Uh, that is really true, and especially just for you to think through your day, I mean, you're you're in the present, but a lot of times you're actually thinking about your past. So that you know that can be a factor in there too. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you my, my mind flits all over the place all of the time. So <laughs> it's it's it's, it's uh, the experience of living is is something that um, that the, the wavers and shakes all the time, isn't it? Really, it is. I think that's really unique. I like that. Yeah. Good. Um, good. What time of day do you find yourself most likely to write? And do you have a special place that you do that? The the, the problem, again, time. I mean, I, I'm a commercial lawyer, so um, I work fairly long hours, Monday to Friday, um, come home exhausted, have some, have some tea, watch an hour of television and crawl up to bed and pass out. So it's really only the weekends I have. And having said that, um, virtually all of my weekends are spelt in writing. So, you know, unless I'm do, doing things with the kids or, or what have you, um, mm-hmm. sort of that, of course. But otherwise, any spare time I have, I spend writing because, um, you know, I'm keen to get stuff out. So I can wake up on a Saturday morning and, and get cracking at six in the morning and write through till six in the evening and then do it again on the Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, but, and I do it, um, actually, my favourite place is lying on my bed. It's just comfy and, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel relaxed there. Um, but um, so, sometimes it's difficult um, finding a quiet spot because, you know, we've got the kids in the house and, and what have you. Um, right. But I've, 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 I mean, I've read of um, different writers' um, habits and, you know, I, it would be great, I'm, I think, to... To be, a fu- to be able to write full time or at least not have to expend the valuable time otherwise, you know, in, in, in doing another job because I think you obviously write best when you're fresh and the whole thing about, uh, and, and that, that, that means therefore in the morning for me, um, you know, you, as, as if, you, if you do, I've, I've read some writers who will maybe uh, full accounts by full time writers, successful writers who um, maybe only do two, three, maybe four hours in the morning. That's it. <laughs> that's that's their working day, and um, that that that's fine. You can probably still produce a book a year if if you're doing that five or six days a week. Um, I have to try and cram all that into just the weekends, and therefore do 12 hours and 10 or 12 hours at a stretch which is more of a struggle towards the end of that 10 or 12 hours right yeah. that's of course because by then your your brain is kind of in overdrive and yeah, you stress you, yourself you, out <laughs> your brain is turned to cornflakes after yeah. a certain, uh, period of time and <laughs> obviously the, the thing about writing is what you what you certainly the, the style i'm uh, writing and i think is is sort of making well, you, you, you're making connections, aren't you? If creative writing, you're um, creating aspects of a person's character and situations, and you will do that if if all your synapses are, are firing at their optimum ability, really. And if you're fresh and not tired, if you're tired, you'll be more sluggish and you, you won't come up with this good stuff. And I think you, there comes a point when you just have to stop and put the pen down and. And, and, and leave it for another day. Yes. Otherwise, the quality of your output will be lessened, I think, won't it? I think so, too. I think you can you can really struggle once you get tired to to make things even connect. You can get yeah. more plot holes and things like that. So it's always good to have a fresh fresh start, like yeah. you said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any real-life experiences that inspired any parts of your book? 
Ah, right. There's um, the um, character, as I say, is um, in London, um, and I spent. I I, I live um, in a place in the sort of north mid northwest stroke Midlands of England near near Stoke on Trent. Um, now. Um, that was where I was born and where I grew up, but moved to London and spent virtually the whole of, of, of my twenties in London. So um, I've based the book in London, and so there's quite a bit of um, the descriptive stuff uh, because Martin and, and Susan. It, it, it's it's the book is also intended to very much reflect its time. So sort of 2007. The other aspect of another aspect that comes in, obviously, is the economic crash, um, because this chap is um, he, he, his, his area of law is commercial property, which is what I've done for many years. So I understand what what happened during the, the you know, the great crash that we saw 10 years ago, in which the effects of which are still being felt. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, the story is in 2007 when the whole thing started to crumble. So he, he, he in the in the intervening period, he's riding the crest of, of the wave of the great boom that preceded the crash. Um, and part of the reason that things start to unravel, uh, and this is where the story story takes you, is um, the problems that envelop. You know the London commercial property market values start dropping, and um, things start appearing out of the woodwork, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know I've I've experienced all that, so so that's there. That comes from my background, and um, you know I've got the, the the idea is very much to sort of try and reflect the zeitgeist at, at that time, so that we've got scenes with Martin and Susan. There's a, there's a long night um, when they go through various um, bars around London, some with fictitious names, others not. And I'm trying to evoke um, the lives and lifestyle of young people, you know, in their 20s living that life, mm -hmm. which, uh, which, which, which I did. Really, I spent all my 20s in London. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a a, a big set piece scene in a um, neo-burlesque club, um, which is um, quite a big scene where quite a lot happens and it's quite um, on the uh, near the knuckle, uh, is an expression I don't know if you're familiar with, but neo-burlesque, it just happened, and this is what I quite like to do, I'll throw into the book, um, stuff that I'm interested in at the time. And I had been watching a documentary on Neo Burlesque, which is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, 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 with the genre at all, but it's, it's a fantastic documentary um, which focuses on performers who are um, in the burlesque scene, but it's, it's updated, so they're producing very expressive acts and very modern acts, whilst taking their clothes off uh and it's is what well, the characters in the documentary were fantastic you know these are these are real performers mm -hmm. so I've, I've got a scene in a, a neo burlesque club where a lot of things happen and, it, and it's quite raunchy if, if, if you like um but no that's that's not an experience i've been through but uh you know <laughs> it's, it's drawn drawn from an interest at the time yeah right okay and there's a murder, so and I've not murdered anyone. So, <laughs> well, see, we've got that confession on tape, so that's good. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'd be more tempted as I get older and have less to lose. Who knows? <laughs> well, what advice would you give to other new authors who might be struggling to, you know, get their first book out, struggling to achieve the dream of becoming a writer? I um. I would, I mean, I would speak only on the back of a few years' experience, but I would echo, I think, the advice that I have read, um, and, and, and which is clearly good advice. I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but of course, cl cliches you are usually cliches because they contain a kernel of truth, and that is... Um, that you do have to find your own voice. And I think that, you know, you hear that again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
someone who it depends on, I suppose, on why do you want to be a writer? Do you want to be a writer because you want to sell a million copies and, and make yourself wealthy? If that's why you want to be a writer, then maybe um, you, 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 you could sort of analyze and copy existing successful styles like crime, like noir, um, like, you know, chick lit or, or, or what have you, the big, big selling genres. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could do that. And maybe, you know, if, if you're um, sufficiently artful at that, maybe you could become a inverted commas successful writer. But to me, that, that, that's a different thing. I, I'm not interested in that. Clearly, I would, I would love um, for my books to sell many copies, but that would be, pr- and, 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 you know, and, and, to, and to have the money, in fact, to have the money to then do it full time. That's the objective, not just money for its own sake, but simply that. Right. But the principal objective is to write books that, that I would love, that I would love and, and share that with, with, with people. That's because to me, my favorite authors, that's what I've got from them. As I said, I've, I've read, right from an early age and and the writers i love have have formed large parts of my consciousness and you know the, the, the my character there's no doubt about it and you're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, in in effect um so that um you 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 you've there's, there's no you know someone like kafka or james joyce um they're clearly uh, unique and original. They're, they're, they are expressing their, their own inner psyche, their, their own personality. And that's what you've got to do. It's no good trying to copy someone else. It's the same as the lessons of life. You've got to be yourself, haven't you? That's great advice. I love that. A lot of yeah. people, you know, have different answers for this. That's why when this, this is one of my favorite questions to ask because there's always a different answer and they're always great ones. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it can be very, it's, it sounds straightforward to do, but it can actually be very difficult to think because, um, and I found this with, uh, you know, dipping my toe into the publishing, publishing industry and sort of having some dealing with editors and, and what have you, um, that you, the problem you can have is if you're trying to, put out there something that you yourself at least you think is original um is that the response that you can often get is that well you know this isn't like jk rowling this isn't like whoever you know that those other things sell this isn't like that therefore it's not going to sell right you you can meet that sort of attitude i think can't you i think um editors and agents the the best i don't know what you you would think about this the best ones to my mind, will be the ones who can spot the original um, work that is maybe not like other stuff, um, but and is therefore more difficult to sort of spot in the great ma- the great slush pile of material that's coming in. That could almost maybe create a new genre for itself. I mean, I often often think you know the, the, again the sort of writers I, I grew up loving, like Kafka, like Joyce. If you presented their manuscripts to most agents now, they would they would be uh, declined, I'm sure. I think that is exactly a you know a good point. You know, you don't have to emulate, like you said, J.K. Rowling or you know any of the Stephen King, any of the major writers. Yeah. Every you just be yourself. Try to have your own unique voice, your own unique writing style. And if anybody. You know, it's everybody has different choices, and your book may be something that they've been waiting for their whole life to read, and it's just well, you know been passed over because it doesn't formulate to something that's a bestseller right now. Yeah, yeah. well, J.K. Rowling is, is 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 a great example, isn't she? I mean, I, she she's one of my heroes. Um, Mine too. She's she's just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I love her for a sort of. The, the career she has now is as a social commentator as well. I think she's great, but she's, but where that comes from to my mind is where she has come from. If, if you read her, her, her life story, you know, she's someone who, uh, was not born with a silver spoon in her mouth and, and had mm-hmm. a very good life until, um, she suddenly accumulated lots of money through, uh, through, I mean, I'm sure she has the difficulties now, but, 
Um, if you imagine J.K. Rowling, uh, well, she was turned by down by scores of people, of course, wasn't she? But if you imagine prior to Harry Potter, you presenting a manuscript, he would go, this, this is a book about a child wizard and what have you, you know, you can, people would say, what, what the hell, you know, that's, <laughs> that never get a sell sort of thing. And uh, even someone like St- Stephen King, who's, who's a renowned writer, as you say, is uh, someone who has his own voice. And I'm, I'm not massively familiar with his, his, his backstory, but, um, you know, he, he, he will have had to have started somewhere, won't he? And, and, and persuaded someone that um, he was worth backing. Right. And like you said, both of them, um, I think a lot of really popular writers, um, I think every writer really who's ever got traditionally published, unless they were just extremely lucky, they were, you know, rejected thousands and thousands of times, yeah. but they kept going. And eventually, you know, someone looked, looked at their manuscript and they said, hey, this is a great idea. That's that's my plan. <laughs> that's the ideal. Yeah, yeah. How long it takes, who knows? But again, I mean, I'm I'm writing because I, I want to produce the books I will like. So I will I will carry on doing it till the die till the day I die, whether or not you know. So um, again, it would be nice to have a wider readership solely because I would like to share this stuff with people you know i spend another good good um, thing to have come out of my involved engagement with promotion and marketing is it, the, that it steered me to social media which i'd not really engaged with before um but it you know i, I realized that that, that, it, that it's a good idea you know if you, to, to get you, you to get you put yourself out there if, if you want to sell well sell anything but but certainly sell something sort of cultural or creative uh, and that has been great. That's been a, a, a great thing for me because I've got a writer, you know, my, I've got my own personal profile, but then obviously got my writer page. And, and I keep adding to that congregation by, um, engaging with people generally. You know, I'm not force feeding them, um, by my book, by my book. I'm just sort of engaging with people generally who are of, of sort of like minded, if you like. And that's been such brilliant fun. Um, over the last few years and that's maybe something I, I would not have done otherwise um yeah that, that's great and i think social media is probably one of the best tools especially for self-published authors anymore yeah. because that's where everybody's at and yeah yeah well it's made me realize once you sort of get into it and get used to it, its inner rhythms and how it all works it, it opened my eyes, really, because people talk blithely about, oh, yeah, you know, social media is, is the new social sphere. Um, but I think once you dive in and get used to it, you realize how true that is. Um, you know, I've, I've, my son, I mentioned earlier, is, is, is 14, and he spends most of his life online. You know, he, he doesn't um, particularly spend a lot of time outside running around the hills <laughs> and what have you. I think uh, that's true for anybody around his age at this it's, point. It's, but I've, I've sort of pretty much stopped stressing about that because, you know, initially I thought, oh, this can't be good for him. But once you sort of spend time in, in social media itself, you realize that there's a whole new generation of people who are now moving into a digital social sphere. And actually, whether you agree with it or not, or whether you like it or not, that is where a large proportion of the human race is going now, that they're going to live digitally online. Uh, and you can choose to ignore that and, and if, if you like. But um, I, I, I've found that uh, engaging with it more and more and you do start building up relationships with people that you've never met physically. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, I think that's another great point, too, because some of my best friends and some of my, my closest connections in the writer world have been through social media. Um, yeah. The whole reason I got into this business is because my, my best friend, me and her, we loved Harry Potter. We never met before. She decided yeah. to write a book, and then she needed someone to edit it and to, to make her a cover. So I helped her out with that, and then I ended up starting my business. And now I do pretty much everything, you know, for pre-publishing. I do all of that now, but I just kind of learned, you know, from that. And we've she's has seven books out now. I mean, yeah. it's just a great way to meet people, like you said, of like mind that you can engage with. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. People, people that, um, I mean, it's a social sphere that you simply wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I mean, particularly, I mean, as I say, I spent most of my 20s in, in London, now in, in, in the middle of a, a great city like London, um, you do have more opportunities, clearly, sort of culturally and, and what have you. Mm-hmm. And I now live back in the sort of northwest of England, near Stoke on Trent, and it's and it's not the same. You know, it has its it has its other advantages over London, but it's it's not the same. So I, you know, I have a whole different sort of experience with a different sort of social sphere uh, with with people from around here, but also with people. From 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 all all over the world, and um, you know, here he, well, you're you're based. Where where is it? You're based. I'm in Virginia, in the United States. Yeah, so here we are chatting. That that's just great. That's that fantastic. Is great. Uh, yeah. Okay, I've got one last question for you before my two year old probably decides to tear up my house. It's been very good, actually. I'm impressed. <laughs> He's, he really likes blues glues. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, my question is what hopes do you have for your future what do you hope your future looks like in the writing world um i i like um i know that um some writers a lot will be will will be determined by how much time i've got if um you know the, the the books i'm writing don't take off to the extent um whereby i can do it full time then I, I will have more limited time. And what I will do, I think, in that event is to continue focusing on producing novels, you know, sort of mid, mid-sized novels. I, I think that's, that, that's a good format for telling a story and getting in, into a, re, you know, a good level of detail. And it's, it's just the right, you know, three, 300 pages or what have you. That, that's, that's about right. If, however, I, um, you know, by good fortune, became a full-time writer, um, I would perhaps then also have the time and opportunity to be more engaged in, in, in the wider sphere, in, in, like J.K. Rowling. Um, she's, she's, she's famous for her forays on, on Twitter and on the, the interventions she makes in the political and social sphere here in the UK. Um, and, and, and is just en- engaged with wider society and culture generally. And I think that would be interesting because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all going through very interesting, stroke disturbing times at the moment, aren't we both? Uh, yes, we are. The side of the Atlantic and, and your side. And, um, you know, we, we, to my mind, we, we all need to engage with that. There's, there's a hell of a battle, um, coming on. For the soul of humanity, as you could say, really. <laughs> I, uh, I have sounds, to agree. <laughs> it sounds grand, but there's all sorts of stuff coming down the the road, really. And I suppose, in in some ways, it was ever thus. But um, you know, to, to to engage more with that, and someone like J.K. Rowling again is is good in the thing that she uses her her fame and her persona in ways that she 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 thinks would would be good and I, I i tend to agree with her on most things and she's i read a story the other day that apparently she's the first person in history to lose her billionaire billionaire status voluntarily mm-hmm. because it's given because she's using so much of the money that, that she has garnered for good works so it's you know that that's it's all of that it would be it would be fantastic to uh, be, you know, be a successful writer and sort of parlay that uh, into other spheres as well. I mean, I'm almost also interested in music. As I say, we had a band until, you know, a fan that didn't have the time to do a band and uh, writing, but I still har- harbour um, ambitions to, to produce records as well. <laughs> so I uh, need the time really to do all these things. Right. See, that that would allow you the time. And I, I do like that. That's something of there are my own goals. If I ever, you know, did become, you know, even half as famous as J.K. Rowling, I'd want to use that in a positive way to influence the world. Yeah. Because once you gain fans and, and things like that, you, you know, a book or a, a book, a writer, anyone of influence can change the world just, you know, by telling the world about their views and 
Well, I think someone like, going back a few more years, someone like John Lennon was the archetype, wasn't he? He was very yes. politically engaged and was followed by millions around the world. And, you know, he, his, and I've, I've got plenty of other inverted commas heroes um, like that who have influenced me. And you think, well, you multiply that by many, many, many people. You can have a real influence for good because there are so many characters out there, particularly at the moment, who are having the reverse uh, influence, aren't they, of course? And they, yes. they, they need to be counted. <laughs> yes. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, Andy. No, I've loved it. Thank you, Courtney. All oh, the yeah. best. I'm going to leave links to all of Andy's social media and websites in the description. Please check those out. If you or someone you know would like to request a Feel Good Friday interview, please send an email to info at fiction-atlas.com with a subject line, Feel Good Friday. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next Friday with more inspiring stories for you.